All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Shriver Hangout. My name is Amanda Moore. I'm a senior attorney editor at the Sergeant Shriver National Center on Poverty Law, where we publish Clearinghouse Review, the Journal of Poverty Law and Policy. So today for our Hangout, we have two authors from our most recent um, issue of Clearinghouse Review. Um, they wrote a great piece called A Collaborative Approach to Housing Under the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act of 2013. So we have with us today Kate Walls. Kate is the Director of Housing Justice at the Shriver Center, and she joins us today from Chicago. Hello, Kate. Hello. We have with us also the co-author of this piece, um, Monica McLaughlin. She is the Senior Public Policy Specialist at the National Network to End Domestic Violence. And Monica is also joining us from Chicago. Hi, Monica. Hi. Well, thank you both very much for joining us, and thanks to our audience for joining us today. Um, we host these Hangouts as a chance for our readers to have an informal conversation with authors about their work, about their articles. So we love it when you participate in this. So there are two ways you may be joining us today. One, you may be joined in through Google Plus and um, watching us in the Hangout. If you are, you have the chance to use this, the Q&A app in Google Hangout. You can find that in the upper right of your screen. There's a little grid of nine squares. If you click that, um, there is a, uh, an icon, a blue icon that says Q&A that will open. And you can ask your questions there. Don't worry, you won't appear on screen or anything like that. Um, if you want to go ahead and try that out, you can. You can just send us your name and where you're watching. Um, there's another way to be watching this. You may be watching through our live stream on the Shriver Center's YouTube channel. Um, in the past, we haven't been able to take your questions, but today we're trying something new. So if you're watching that way and you have a question for Kate or Monica, um, you can submit that through Twitter. So you can tweet us at Shriver Center, and we'll get your questions and pass those along to our authors. Um, and you can go ahead and feel free to try that out now, too, if you want. It's at Shriver Center. Um, I want to go ahead and jump right in. We're going to be with Kate and Monica for half an hour, and that just flies by. Um, their article is its a great piece about how legal aid attorneys and housing providers and advocates for survivors of domestic violence or sexual assault can uh, work together to make sure that those survivors have um, safe and adequate housing. And um, I want to just make sure we're all sort of on the same page when we begin. So Kate, I'd like to start with you and have you just give us a brief overview of what we're talking about when we're talking about VAWA 2013, the Violence Against Women Reauthorization <coughs> Act of 2013, and what those provisions are that, that are relevant to these, this idea of collaborations. Sure. So VAWA 2013, at its most basic level, prohibits a housing provider, and now that includes nine additional federal housing programs in, a, in addition to the existing programs of public housing, the voucher program, and project-based Section 8 program, who cannot deny admission, terminate assistance, or evict an individual due to the, the fact that they are a victim of domestic violence, and now under VAWA 2013, also due to the fact that they're a victim of sexual assault. Um, also including dating violence um, as well. And um, in addition, um, the housing provider now under Bower 2013 um, can transfer a survivor to other covered housing in certain circumstances, or that tenant may be eligible for a tenant protection voucher. Um, and victims of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking cannot be subject to a more demanding standard um, than any other tenant. Some of the other new provisions are, um, in addition to covering sexual assault providers in the new housing programs, VAWA 2013 also covers lesbian, gay, and transgender survivors. It allows, uh, it also protects undocumented survivors. And it allows a survivor to remain in a covered housing program after the abuser leaves and gives them time to establish eligibility for that federal housing program. So this new rollout of protections building off of VAWA 2005 uh, really calls for a collaborative approach where housing advocates and uh, 
survivor advocates can come together with providers to implement VAWA 2013 and to go beyond that and to address some of the day-to-day real-life issues affecting survivors. Great. Thank you very much for that explanation. Uh, Monica, I want to ask you about this idea of the collaborations. What are we talking about when we talk about a collaboration and how did this, how did this notion come about? Yes, thanks, Amanda. Um, we, um, you know, the collaborations I think, as Kate was describing, are between um, the housing authorities, uh, legal services, and victim advocates. And just a note about victim advocates, you know, we think that victim advocates can be a local domestic violence program, um, but also can be uh, a statewide domestic violence coalition or a citywide domestic violence coalition, um, that that can often bring economies of scale in terms of being able to connect this to broader housing advocacy, um, connect this to other trainings. So I think that those that's a good point to make that advocates can if advocate in the local domestic violence shelter doesn't feel equipped to do uh, the outreach or the building the relationship, they can partner with others um, in their state and in their community. And I think, um, and just to build on what Kate was saying about um, why the collaborations, I think that the, um, as she was saying, you know, VAWA 2013 is has a lot of new provisions within it, and um, and that VAWA 2013 right now is sort of uh, black and white in law, but for it to come to life and the spirit of VAWA 2013 to really come to life, it needs to have some very specific community-driven and community-led initiatives, and to move it not just to sort of cross the T and dot the I of the law, um, but to go beyond that and to say, how is it that we can work together um, on behalf of survivors? And so advocates come to the table with the experiential knowledge of domestic violence. Why is it that survivors' um, lives uh, look a certain way? Um, and legal services can have that um, really nuanced understanding of the law and what survivors' rights are and the obligations of the housing authorities. And then housing authorities can come to the table with a very clear description of their actual practices. Um, and so together that collaboration can uh, really look at sort of how does, how will we come together to provide the best set of practices for survivors of violence, keep our property safe and, and have some place for survivors to go or to stay. Great, thank you. Um, I want to say we've had a lot of viewers join us in the past few minutes. I want to uh, remind them that they can submit their questions to Kate and Monica one of two ways. If you're in Google+, Plus, you can open the Q&A app in the upper right corner of your screen. If you're watching through YouTube, you can submit your questions to us via Twitter at um, our handle is at Shriver Center. Um, I also want to say to people, if you have not had a chance to look at Kate and Monica's article yet, you can find it on the Shriver Center's website. That's povertylaw.org. Um, and there you'll find links to Clearinghouse Review. It's in the current issue. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, these, you know, these three groups that you mentioned, the providers, legal services attorneys, and uh, victim advocates. Are there already relationships often among these groups, or is this something that um, requires a little groundwork before the collaborations can be built? I, I think it depends on each jurisdiction. I think that frequently um, it's been our experience that legal service providers will have um, uh, a fairly uh, difficult relationship with housing providers because they're defending tenants in eviction cases. They might be bringing affirmative suits against that provider for alleged violations of the law. And, and so it, it may not be, for the most part, a positive relationship. Uh, and I think that's in part why we're suggesting in the article that for many reasons you really let the survivor advocates lead this discussion. Um, they may not have a relationship with the housing providers. Um, they certainly should um, to address this overarching priority of VAWA uh, to combat homelessness among victims of domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, but I think it really it varies jurisdiction by jurisdiction. You know, at what stage the, that relationship is already at. Great. Um. When we're talking about the advocates, uh, either legal services or survivor advocates, P 
people are already so pressed for time. How do those advocates make time to build these collaborations? Um, how do they do that? And is it, I mean, I'm assuming you'll say it is worthwhile, but why exactly is it worth spending that time, that precious time to do this? Yeah, I can answer that. I certainly um, know that victim advocates are pressed for time, and I think that there are ways to make this work um, part of everyday work in some ways. So adding uh, training to other training that uh, an advocacy organization is already providing and tailoring it specifically to the housing community I think is really useful. So if you're already hosting a training, inviting your local um, housing authority to come to that training I think is really useful and I think is a way to kind of get um, an economy of scale. Again, I think partnering at the statewide level, if your state coalition is doing a training to try to um, work with that um, existing training. And I think that there is work, um, advocates are often working in the housing and homelessness world in another avenues um, and I think that being able to if you're going to provide training for um, say homeless service providers you could add the housing authority uh, providers as well to that training because you're, you you want to talk about the intersection between domestic violence and housing instability and homelessness so you sort of have that um, approach already in your training and I think adding the housing authorities um, would be relatively a relatively easier lift um, and I think one of the reason one of the benefits on both sides is that um, if we're able to prevent uh, survivor survivors facing homelessness uh, through their publicly uh, or public and assisted housing um, that that means that um, we'll have fewer survivors demanding our shelter services, but we can still continue to provide services to survivors um, in an out, um, a non-residential or outreach capacity. So uh, in that way, you provide yourself as a resource to the housing authority, um, and then you're able to um, have clients be referred from the housing authority, um, but doesn't necessarily have to be in your shelter. And we know that survivors are turned away from shelter often because shelters are full. Um, and so this is a way to avoid homelessness. One other point that I want to make, which is sort of true of most efforts, is that there's a lot of upfront effort, a lot of uh, investment to begin with, and uh, of course there's ongoing training, but um, I think that those in upfront investments pay off by being able to really transform your systems um, to improve the lives of survivors. And local domestic violence advocates and their statewide domestic violence coalitions are really used to that work, and so this is just um, adding a layer to that work. And I'll just add for legal service attorneys that um, ideally the objective would be to be reducing cases coming into legal service offices related to domestic violence and eviction. That that by really working with that provider and educating them on the law um, that you're going to reduce the number of cases you'll have uh, regarding that. That's a great point. That's a great point. So one thing I like about um, your article and this idea is that it's not just an idea. This is being implemented in places. And I wonder, um, Kate, I'll start with you. Can you give us an example of where this is in place now and how it's going? So um, we actually did this in Chicago with the then Mayor's Office on Domestic Violence, uh, where we approached the Chicago Housing Authority actually shortly prior to the passage of VAWA 2005 and uh, said we want to have a conversation with you about what's happening to survivors of violence who live in your housing. You know, we have some anecdotal information that concerns us. We've also looked at your policies and, and we're concerned. But this is not a gotcha moment. We are not here to tell you we're going to sue. We want to develop model policies with you. And it took about a year uh, of work with the CHA, but uh, we had very a, a set of numerous discussions with them and draft model policies. There was a lot of candor on both sides about resources, about limitations, um, about bias. 
And um, in the end, uh, we developed um, a set of protocol that we've been able to use with other providers um, to help develop model um, model policies for survivors. And and the CHA, to its credit, uh, has even gone so far, and we talk about this in the article, of evaluating its programs, of having an outside research entity evaluate its programs to see if they're working, and then to make further changes based on those programs. So we felt like there was real internal buy-in to this uh, collaborative approach. Uh, what we know of, uh, in terms of other jurisdictions, Philadelphia has done this. Uh, there was a group of advocates that worked with the State Housing Finance Agency in Pennsylvania uh, to implement some uh, terrific policies for survivors of violence. Um, also in New York, um, even that even predates VAWA 2005, uh, Minnesota, and Oakland. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question that's come in through Twitter I want to share with you. Um, do either of you know of any efforts to tie these same VAWA protections to other state housing money? And is this connected to the money or is this just um, something that's come about through the, the actual substance of the changes in 2013? Um, I am not aware of an effort, in Illinois at least, to connect it to state funds. Um, though obviously, as, as uh, probably people joining the Google chat know, there's an increasing recognition that discrimination against victims of domestic violence can constitute sex discrimination under the Federal Fair Housing Act. Um, that uh, line of case law and guidance from FHEO, I think, has led to looking at um, this issue for all housing providers and all funding streams related to housing, whether it's local, state, or federal. I don't know if, Monica, if you have thoughts on that. The condition with which I'm most familiar is in the OVW transitional housing grant funding. Um, if you are a successful applicant for that funding, you must um, have VAWA housing policies. So if you're partnering with a federally subsidized housing authority, um, those that housing authority, in order to be successful at obtaining the VAWA transitional housing funds, has to comply with VAWA. Okay, great. Um, Monica, I have a question for you. Um, in the article, it, it sort of, you know, leaves the same, you know, there are more changes coming to VAWA with regulations. Uh, Monica, do you know what's next with VAWA? Sure. Um, we, so VAWA passed uh, last spring, and then um, since then, the um, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development which is the biggest agency that oversees VAWA implementation, issued a VAWA notice, which was to give stakeholders across the board um, the update on what VAWA 2013 entails. Um, and then they began, uh, and advocates were able to submit comments on that notice, and then they began in earnest the kind of work to uh, determine what the actual regulations would say, and the regulations are uh, the, the way to kind of push beyond what the law says to help um, housing authorities implement VAWA. And so we believe that the uh, regulations on VAWA are forthcoming. Um, we sort of heard before the end of the year, but now it may be uh, the beginning of next year, since this year is uh, quickly coming to a close. Um, but we do anticipate seeing some regulations uh, within the near future. And I believe that what will happen at that point is that the regulations will be open for comment. They might be an interim rule or a proposed rule, um, sort of which just means that advocates can um, come together and say, oh, I think this would work, or I don't think that would work, and then submit them through this um, formal regulatory process. Great. Thanks for the update. Um, I want to step back for a second from the substance of your article, and I don't know if you'd call this a meta question or what, um, but I'm curious about how the two of you decided to get together and write this article, why you thought it was important to get this word out, and how, how the two of you, if you already had a relationship with work you've done, um, just curious how this came about. So I, I forget when Monica and I first 
became introduced, I think it was with the 2013 reauthorization working through the amendments. Is that right, Monica? Yeah, I think that's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I think uh, many of the 2013 proposed amendments to, to VAWA uh, came out of work that we and others had done to sort of push beyond the legal framework of VAWA 2005 to do more for our clients and survivors of violence. And so when we were able to demonstrate things, for example, such as we had created a transfer policy within our project-based Section 8 program in Chicago already, and the sky hadn't fallen, and housing providers were able to provide housing, and survivors were safe, we were able to give that as, a, uh, as information to, to HUD um, and, and to Congress about why it was possible and necessary to do it. And so um, a lot of these conversations have been happening internally within this small community working on uh, VAWA 2013. And, and so we thought it was a really good idea to, to share it so that the next reauthorization is even better, ideally based on this collaborative approach. Yeah, and I, I would say that we, um, that Kate has been uh, part of our VAWA housing group that we uh, work at the federal level to pass the law and um, has often provided a very practical voice in terms of someone who's um, used the law to help um, individuals and also create this um, process in Chicago. And, you know, our advocates uh, supported NNEDV's work to push for VAWA reauthorization, which included housing protections because uh, of anything that survivors present to advocates, housing is often near the top. The need for housing, safe, affordable housing, and um, legal services are some of the two things that survivors need um, in the most pressing way. And so we did a great, a, a big call before we looked at VAWA 2013 reauthorization to ask advocates what is it that they want to see um, with improvements to the VAWA housing provisions. And that is when we brought that information to the group and that's when Kate and I um, discussed this. That's great. Uh, Monica, could you tell us a little bit about the National Network to End Domestic Violence? What, who, who is a, who, what is this a network of? Sure. Um, so we are the um, membership organi organization of the 56 state and territorial domestic violence coalitions. We represent them um, and their member um, local domestic violence programs and of course the survivors that they provide. And we do, um, we do have a housing um, project uh, where we provide training to OVW transitional housing um, grantees and we also do uh, a lot of housing policy work um, and but we do work beyond that with economic justice, confidentiality, um, and other um, issues around capacity of local domestic violence programs. Great. And Kate, I'll give you a chance to say the same thing. Um, I know I'm very familiar with the Shriver Center, but our audience may not be as familiar. So let's focus just on the housing component of um, what we do. You are the Director of Housing Justice there. What, what are the focuses of, of your work? Uh, the focus of our work is largely on the, uh, the assisted stock, federally assisted housing, or also affordable rental housing. So we work in terms of preservation of that stock, uh, we bring fair housing cases, affirmative suits, and then we also have a project in collaboration with the Women's Law and Policy Project called the Safe Homes Initiative. And through that, we've done our VAWA work. We've done state-level work, such as uh, passing a law um, to allow a survivor of violence to end their lease early if they need to flee um, or to receive an emergency lock change. And we've, al we've also done litigation under that project to protect the fair housing rights of survivors of violence. Great. So two very... Um I would say, esteemed experts in this field. I'm so glad you all took the time to write this article. Uh, speaking of which, we have a question from Mary who's asked how people can get a copy of the article. Um, the article is in the current issue of Clearinghouse Review, the Journal of Poverty Law and Policy. You can find that on the website of the Sergeant Shriver National Center on Poverty Law, which is povertylaw.org. 
www.clearinghousereview.org. And when you go there, you'll see the links to Clearinghouse Review. It's in the current issue. Um, and if you have any trouble accessing it, you can send me a note. Uh, my email address is Amanda Moore, M-O-O-R-E, at povertylaw.org. Um, that goes for anyone if you have any trouble with the article or if you um, have some feedback on this um, Hangout on Air with our authors. We would love to hear it. Um, checking to see if we have any other questions that have come through. Uh, Mary submitted her question via uh, the Google Hangout. She's logged in there through the Q&A app. We're also accepting questions through Twitter. You can tweet us at Shriver Center. Um, okay. Um, I want to thank our guests once again. I've just realized we've come to the end of our half hour. It always just flies past. Uh, we have Kate Walls with the Shriver Center and Monica McLaughlin with the National Network to End Domestic Violence. Uh, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you who have tuned in and um, spent this time with us. This is our last Hangout with Authors for 2014. We'll be back in the new year. Um, our guest, our first guest for Hangout on Air in 2015 will be Michael Hollander. He's a staff attorney at uh, Community Legal Services in Philadelphia. He's went, written a great article. Um, I, I just love it. It's about how to collect on wage judgments for our low-wage clients. Um, it's a really practical piece, and so he'll be our guest um, when we come back in 2015. Um, and until then, I want to thank everyone for joining us, and I want to wish you all a very happy holiday season. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.